G'day and welcome to Pello Talk. I'm Dave Pello, and uh, every now and then I get to do some interviews and I'd like to do a whole lot more. And uh, for those of you who are financially supporting the show, thank you. I appreciate that a whole lot. As soon as we increase that support significantly, we're going to be able to get uh, other people, staff on board to help with the production and uh, free me up to do more of the research and writing and uh, talking with some of the thought leaders in not only our nation, but the wide world. And, uh, you know, one of the most important questions for me, uh, if there's any mark I want to leave on this world uh, when, when I'm gone and my time is done, when my options and availability for making a difference is finished, if there was only one thing I could change, it would be that my generation would end abortion. Uh, for me, this is the greatest injustice of multiple generations, not just our own. Uh, it beggars belief that anybody would pick anything else, especially when one of our pri previous prime ministers said uh, the changing climate was the greatest moral dilemma of our time. And we don't have a super huge nation, but when he said that, we were killing between 80 to 100,000 Australians per year subsidised with taxpayer money, that certainly violates my conscience, uh, in an industrial, hidden and discreet setting. I, I don't know how the climate can be even relevant morally when we are funding the industrialised slaughter of unborn living humans. But here's the important question. Is it an actual living human? Uh, believe it or not, there's a whole bunch of people who aren't very clear on this. Um, and some people who would rather we didn't know even if they suspect the horrible, horrible truth. Uh, and so the science is something that we should be very, very open to and very embracing of. Uh, and so it was with a great deal of uh, satisfaction that I came across the work of Dr. Steve Jacobs. His uh, PH doctoral thesis was essentially researching the question of what is the scientific consensus. Now, I've never been someone who thinks uh, science is democratic. Um, the number of people supporting a thesis doesn't prove the thesis. That that has to stand or fall on its own based on the merits and uh, observable evidence. Um, but nevertheless, it is something that we can take some lead from. Uh, let's have a look at this evidence. If a whole bunch of scientists are looking there, then we owe the question, um, some sincere inquiry. Uh, what exactly are these people seeing that we may be disagreeing with? And so I don't think there's anything more important um, than to find out the truth on the question of are we or are we not perpetrating the greatest human rights violation of a century? Uh, and so with no further ado, I would like to welcome to Pello Talk uh, Dr. Steve Jacobs. It's time for us to do something. Steve, welcome. Thank you for having me, Dave. Now, your, uh, your doctoral thesis research uh, was very exciting, uh, and so were the conclusions, uh, and maybe even heartbreaking at the same time. Uh, however, let's go back a whole bunch. Um, before you came up to doing your doctoral thesis, um, you had a question on your mind and you've been, um, even before you, you started this thesis, uh, you had been on a significant journey. Uh, just share with me briefly, um, I think just before we started the show, you were saying your undergraduate degree was in psychology. Why did you start a psychology degree? So um, I, it's kind of a funny beginning. Basically, I, I remember uh, sitting down with the course catalog and deciding between accounting, which I'd shown some talent for in high school, and psychology, which I had taken courses in and I found really interesting. And the prospect of taking 20 accounting classes wasn't too seductive. Uh, <laughs> so what really interested me about psychology was the ability to combine that with uh, philosophy classes and ethics courses. So uh, at Northeastern Illinois University, I studied a sequence of ethics courses, and this is really where the, the seed was planted for my research on the abortion debate. So I had noticed that 
human rights was this prominent concept that for some reason wasn't used in the abortion debate. So even though I, I had this intuitive sense that pro-life people used what was functionally a human rights argument at the time in 2008, not many were using the language of human rights. Mm. I also noticed that personhood as a concept was used inclusively. So philosophers, ethicists, they used it to expand the category of human to non-human persons who are deserving of recognition, legal recognition. So at the time there was an Ar Argentinian court that had granted personhood to an orangutan. We were having these discussions about how robots or technology could be ascribed personhood. But I thought it was weird that fetuses were the one category where they were actually seen as human non-persons. So I didn't understand why this tool that was meant to be inclusive to extend, extend humanity to non-human elements, why was this being used to dehumanize fetuses? So really, I just saw that there, there, was, there were some missing perspectives that I really wanted to explore and understand. And uh, that, that's what started in my undergrad. I uh, actually published an article on The Good Source uh, maybe a week or two ago um, because a river in New Zealand had recently been granted personhood. Oh. Uh, and and um, the, the, the graphic for the article, I really love doing the artwork for a lot of the articles, but the graphic for the article had the, the river coming down the middle and mm. then the Da Vinci illustrations of the fetus left and right. Well, that's so um, and, and so we just had person with arrows pointing to the river and mm -hmm. not a person with arrows pointing to da Vinci's drawings of, of the fetus. And wow. it's very powerful. And, um, and, and, and surely it's a sign of the end of a civilization when it, it goes through those kind of logical contortions to right. um, justify perpetuating violation of human rights. You know, I am 100% uh, on board with you. Um, I, I haven't actually written an article yet on, on the, the universe. Well, actually, in the recent anniversary of the the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, mm -hmm. um, I uh, I actually did comment a little bit on on that there, and and I actually think that language is rather powerful. I think you're onto something um, because, uh, and and here's why I'm actually so interested in, in your research. And, and again, we're we're just on the same page here. Right. Um, the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that the following, all of these rights, all the, all the items and articles that we're about to describe belong to all members of the human family. That's right. Uh, and so therefore, surely the important question is, who's a member of the human family? And in uh, Article 6, it says that everyone is deserving of recognition as persons under the law. So like you said, when you combine those two, I understand yep. that philosophers would like to manipulate and, as you said, distort the concept of personhood. But the Universal Declaration of Human Rights couldn't be any clearer that humans and persons are fungible entities that are fully rec uh, deserving of uh, legal rights. Yeah. And look, there are other problems with the Universal Declaration of Human oh. Rights. And I'm just I'm just looking off screen right now because I'm looking for that article to see if I can bring it up. But um mm -hmm. The, uh, the reality is that while there are other problems with it, this is the language they use. Exactly. Uh, and so if we, can, if we can persuade them in their language right. using their definitions. On their um, playing field ostensibly, right? They're, they're the one, that's, that's the language of the dominant group, right? And here pro-life, yeah. they're trying to leverage that you know, even though most pro-life or, you know, many pro-lifers are uh, religious and they might see the Bible as their authority, they're willing to meet pro-choicers where they're at. And we're, we're working with these human rights concepts. And unfortunately, because they deny the humanity of the fetus, they do not see uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights being applicable to fetal rights. Oh, look yeah. Wow. Wow. So there we go. Human rights aren't for humans. Uh, Grant Vandersey wrote this. It was a great, uh, great article. Mm. And um, yeah, I just loved doing that artwork. Person, not a person. Mm. <clears throat> and, and that's just the the insanity of this position. So you finished your degree in psychology. And mm. uh, and then as, as we're talking with um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 
you uh, you figured out that a framework for arguing legal language was going to be important, and you went on to to study law. Yeah. Um, was that your master's? Uh, so um, the way our PhD program worked was you would do a master's as part of the PhD program. And then my law degree was actually at a separate institution. So I did my oh, PhD right. at the University of Chicago. And then I did my law degree at Northwestern, which was, you know, uh, Northwestern's downtown. And then uh, University of Chicago is a few miles outside downtown. So And you did uh, uh, did your PhD where? At the University of Chicago. And uh, how did you come up with your uh, your idea, uh, and and how did you pitch that to your supervisor? So that's yeah, that's interesting. So um, within my first year at the University of Chicago, <clears throat> I took a course on the qualitative methods in the social sciences, where basically for our course paper we had to propose a a, re uh, a research study. And we need, needed to explore which methodological perspectives we would use, what, what kind of methods we would use to study this question. So when I proposed exploring how I could do my master's and eventually my dissertation on the abortion debate, my professor actually said, no, it's too controversial, you can't do it. And when I explained that the controversy was the very thing I was interested in studying, he still said, no, you can't do it. And I basically languished for a few years before I could find a professor who was willing to support my research. And it was only once I committed to going to law school, yeah, you know, I took the LSAT and did everything and, and was, um, was accepted to Northwestern. And then I found a professor who was willing to support me. Um, now, at this, this is kind of an interesting st story. In terms of the actual study asking biologists on when life begins, this started at Northwestern. I was uh, taking a public persuasion class, one that taught us how to write speeches and deliver speeches. And I gave a, my first talk on abortion. And in the talk, I suggested that there was a consensus on when life begins based on my review of biological textbooks, medical school textbooks. And the, the professor after class actually wrote on my, spa uh, my paper, uh, where is the source next to my claim? And in that moment, I realized, oh, yeah, if you want a source, I could, I could go out and get the source. So I, what, what started, you know, what he meant for evil, I, it ended up being for good because he was trying to be snarky and undermine me. But all it did was plant the seed for me uh, studying this question. Academia. Um, yeah. <laughs> whatever you do, don't tell us the truth. Um, it, it, it's uh, it's its own little uh, interview topic in itself, isn't it? Um, just sure. just how prejudiced, and I actually think that word is very powerful with a theolog with a, a um, law insight uh, mm -hmm. that prejudicial before the evidence we've already made up our mind. That's right. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that kind of prejudice is is just well, like if if you bring prejudice to the academy, um, mm -hmm. the pursuit of knowledge, then how is that anything other than just a religion? Uh, right. It's it's not in the least bit uh, intellectually honest. It's yeah. it's a false religion, of course. It's completely against the spirit of empiricism, which is something that we should be you know working toward mm. in academia. And sorry, go ahead. So my uh, first job out of school, just for the sake of, of uh, license to <laughs> um, demean and, and uh, crack jokes about, uh, was uh, digging ditches as a plumber's apprentice. Um, okay. So for the plumbers who are watching, what is the spirit of empiricism? Explain oh, that. Uh, basically that things are knowable, that things can be explored, that as empiricists, we should ex actually ask operational questions things that we could study, that we could learn about, as opposed to, let's say, you know, I don't know if I want to step on this hornet's nest, but let's just say critical race, is, uh, critical race theory and a lot of what we're seeing coming out of the humanities. Mm. One could argue it's fundamentally anti-empiricism because now even I, I just saw Scientific America had a piece coming out suggesting that no uh, hypothesis is falsifiable going against the nature of falsifiability. And I mean, they're, they're just going against the very nature of science, which is, you know, posing a hypothesis, testing yep. it, making sure that it's falsifiable, that you could actually- And falsifiable it, means you can prove it's wrong? Or disprove it, yeah. 
or disprove it. Right. Yep. Yeah. Great. Because if I, could, I just make a claim that there's no way in which you could prove it wrong. Well, what what's the utility of that claim, right? Yep. Okay. So you get asked, uh, what's your source for claiming there's a consensus yeah. among biologists on the definition of of life, and um, and then uh, you say, I'm going to go ahead and find that. Was it? Uh, how long did it take for you to jump from? I don't have a source to uh, that will be my doctoral dissertation. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Um, so at the at the same time, I was becoming a certified mediator. So while at, uh, in law school, I took a series of courses and I, I became a trained mediator, figuring out how to sit down with, let's say, a plaintiff and a, a defendant and figuring out how they can move forward amicably without having to um, avail themselves to the law by uh, letting a judge rule in their case. So I used to go to uh, small claims courts between, let's say, landlord and tenants. And uh, we used to sit down and just have a discussion about how they could move forward amicably. So I used that methodology to study the abortion debate. And what I found was uh, I actually conducted these mediations between pro-life and pro-choice law students. And I found that we couldn't move forward with a productive discussion without defining what a what a fetus was. Because wh when you think about it, it, it really is the bedrock of this debate. If it's true that a, that a fetus is not a human, let's say it's true that uh, life begins at birth, essentially pro-life people are just trying to force people to have children. They're not protecting life. They're not protecting humans. They just want to force women to uh, have children. If it's true that a fetus is a human, then pro-choice people actually do not believe in universal human rights and they believe only certain humans deserve rights, those who've already mm. been born. So it's this really crucial question and, and it explains why it's one that's of such debate and why it's one that, you know, if you go on Twitter or you go to any discussion on abortion, very few pro-choice people will either admit or stipulate to the fact that fetuses are humans because mm. it makes the case for legal abortion so much more difficult. If yep. you give them their druthers, if you grant that it's not a human, it, it's an open and shut case. But if you can prove that a fetus is a human and that all humans are persons under you know, the UHR or even under the U.S. Constitution, it just mm. becomes an incredibly difficult case for them to make. And that's yep. part of the reason why Roe v. Wade punted on this question and didn't even assert whether or not a fetus was a human, suggesting that they didn't need to resolve the difficult question on when life begins. Um, so th this was, you know, it, it was his suggestion at the same time as me working as a mediator and realizing that I need to basically address what is the central factual dispute of the abortion debate. Obviously with opinions, it's very difficult to convince people one way or another because mm. they have different values or different sensitivities, but on a factual basis, everybody should be willing to admit the underlying science. Yeah, correct. Now, I just want to uh, play this clip, and if it doesn't work, I'll insert it later. But tell me, uh, can you hear this sound or, or shake your head if, if you can't? Okay, so I'm saying whether it's a tree or fungus yeah. or an animal, where there's uh, cell replication and mitosis, growth and development, um, without intervention, isn't that the universal scientific definition of life, whether you found it on Mars or in a womb? And then she says, I don't think there is a universal scientific definition right. of life. Uh, so this is the question you're asking. And that, of course, was uh, Dr. Leah Torres. Uh, and she is an abortion apologist, a very accomplished and high-profile one. Uh, and um, and uh, yeah, her her. I mean, she's a board-certified obstetrician gynecologist. Uh, and in the uh, great investment of her medical biological uh, education, um, they failed to address <laughs> what's the definition of life. Um, and, and of course, we, we can be very, very pedestrian about this. Um, the plumber's apprentice can easily know that if you took what's in a womb and put it on Mars, there would be nobody um, equivocating about whether or not we discovered life on Mars. That's yeah. life. 
Um, okay. Surely this is high school biology. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, you uh, set about um, being a little bit more um, intellectually honest and objective. Uh, how did that, how did you, what was your methodology? Uh, I think the first thing um, you started with was asking average people who they thought was best qualified to answer the question. That's right. So at the end of the day, it, it wouldn't make sense for me to just say, okay, biologists are the most qualified to answer this question, because I actually don't know that the majority of Americans would assent to the authority of biologists, right? Mm. So it could be just this intractable question that one side says we should be listening to religious leaders, and the other side says we should listen to philosophers, and neither side cares about biologists, right? Mm. That, that was possible. And this is what I'm, I'm talking about in terms of empiricism, right? This is something that I would actually have to ask people and explore. So I had surveyed over 4,000 Americans um, online, and I found that over 80% selected biologists as the- Now, group. let me ask the, um, the important questions. How did you select them? Was the, the methodology for itself kind of uh, prejudicing, or how random was the oh. sample of people you asked that to? Right. So this was a completely random sample on Amazon, Amazon's MTurk. So it's called Mechanical Turk. Basically, it's this uh, website where uh, tons of researchers use it as a participant pool. You can target people by state, by age, by gender. I opened it up to anybody who was in America. Uh, now, as, as is uh, typically the case uh, with MTurk, they were more likely to be non-religious more likely to be liberal, Democrat. So overall, it was 80% selected biologists from a list that I posed based on Roe v. Wade. So in, in Roe v. Wade, when the court contemplated the question of when life begins, they had suggested that it wasn't even clear if it should be answered from a biological perspective, a philosophical perspective, a theological perspective, a legal perspective. So I presented them with a list of biologists, philosophers, religious leaders, Supreme Court justices, and voters. I saw yep. that as representing the full gamut of uh, what, which perspective this question should be answered from, right? Sure. So let me just uh, interject that um, it, it should be stated as fact, or my assertion is um, that uh, Supreme Court justices are respectable, but not authoritative. Uh, mm -hmm. They have made really, really, really bad law in oh. American history. Uh, mm -hmm. And the perfect example, if we're going to take Roe v. Wade out of the uh, options, would be the Dred Scott case, mm -hmm. where the justices in their finite wisdom, uh, no sarcasm um, <laughs> <laughs> availed, um, in their li very limited wisdom, they decided that the Constitution actually provided for the property of people as possessions. Um, yeah. Hearkening eerily uh, to the uh, Roe v. Wade decision. Um, however, um, there was a black man who wanted his freedom and essentially his owner uh, took him to court or took the state to, to court, which had, had attempted to free him. Um, and and the, the justices said, um, the government doesn't, the, nobody has the right to take your property off you regarding then the man as property. Uh, very, very bad law, which mm -hmm. um, future courts overturned necessarily. Um, and we recognised that the Supreme Court does not always get it right. Um, yeah. And so this important question is there, that even the Supreme Court in Roe v. Wade, it, Wade saying we don't know who's qualified to do this was was a demonstration of, of poor knowledge. And so you went to the people, a randomised um, survey and over 80% of them had the consensus that biologists were most qualified. That's right. And uh, the pro-choice participants, those who supported abortion, they were actually more likely to select biologists than the pro-life participants. So very interesting participants, they had suggested religious leaders to be most qualified. But as for- See, I don't even agree with that. I, I can't relate mm -hmm. to that as a Christian. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm about as Bible believing as they get. Yeah. Um, but I, I still marry a love of science um, and natural law mm -hmm. with my love of the Word of God. Um, sure. And and I think, yeah. I, have you got any insights or suggestions, uh, guesses as to why um, 
pro-choice people um, would prefer biologists and, and pro-life people would prefer theologians. So both preferred biologists. It was just that pro, pro-choice pro people were even more likely to prefer them. And I, I personally okay. think a big aspect of this was from a strategic perspective, right? So it could be that the pro-life people were, were not confident that biologists would actually correctly state the biology. Fascinating. They felt that a religious leader would be more likely to recognize the sanctity of human life in mm. affirming that a, a fetus is a human. Um, but what I, I think what was most interesting was the fact that I, I had my advisor, I had many of my colleagues and peers suggesting that they thought pro-choice people would select philosophers because mm. they know that from a philosophical Leotaras would. <laughs> oh, right, because you can define it however you want, right? She, I mean, she, she, she said to me over and over and over, let's not bring <laughs> philosophy into this. And then over and over and over, she made it philosophical. Oh, of course. And, and that's why I, I was interested how many were truly honest. And it was because I had decoupled the question of when life begins from the question of what is the nature of the question of when life begins? So when I followed it up by so giving them a essay question and I asked them, why did you select this person? And over 92% said they selected biologists because they were objective experts in the study of life. I mean, it's right there in the name in biology, right? So um, I, I basically was given my mandate to go forth and to ask biologists uh, from a biological perspective, because, you know, the reason I asked the essay is also they could have technically said it's not because it's a biological question, but because I believe biologists are moral and upstanding citizens who will be honest. But right. no, they targeted them because of their biological perspective. Okay. And that's what led me when I uh, posed the surveys to biologists to ask very narrowly about their biological perspective on the question. Right. Um, now, I think you used the words uh, descriptive in your executive summary. Um, yeah. Was it des descriptive as opposed to normative? That's correct. Woohoo! I'm getting yeah. academic. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, so, um, yeah, and this goes back to David Hume, uh, famous philosophers, is ought distinction. So there's a difference between what something is and what something ought to be, right? So you could actually look at this question of, of when a human's life begins as the difference between the descriptive perspective, which is what is this thing? Is it which, which is the nature of science. You are there to right. observe. Yes. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, when people use the words science says, um, you, you know they've got an agenda because science doesn't say anything. That's science, correct. it's like a, an apple. It doesn't yep. say anything. It just sits there and you get to observe what it is, but there's no ought question or answer in the apple. Exactly. Although you could use the is to to bear on your question of ought, right? And I mean, yeah. I think that's in the very nature of human rights is you have to know, is this thing a human in order yep. to grant it human rights? And this this would And, and that's why I wear this T-shirt. Yes. Yeah. Is, is because uh, <laughs> this is the ought this is what people try and they give, try and give it a technical label yeah uh, and i'm happy for you to call it a gumboot if that makes you happy right uh, because that's not what we're talking about this mm -hmm. is what we're talking about this is the is yes. uh, and so if you're happy on killing who and what this obviously is yeah back to you right um so so with the with the is odd, yeah, just quite simply, I I think this is another area in which we'll say the more uh, the bigger supporters of abortion rights they they seek to distract and confuse and conflate this discussion when really it's ju it's just really simple. The the reason why I asked biologists is I wanted an objective understanding of whether or not this fetus is is a human or a non human. You know, yep. is it akin? to my skin cells or my liver cells, that they are human mm. in terms of the adjective, or are they human in terms of the noun, where, you know, obviously your skin cells are qualitatively different from another human. That other human is an actual human organism. It is a human, the noun, 
It is not yep. only human, the adjective. And so what was the question that you asked biologists? So I had actually presented them with uh, five different questions uh, because I needed to vary the, the question in terms of how explicit or implicitly it was framed. Because if you just come out to biologists and say, you know, is a fetus a human? That allows for enough of a signal that they might think this is a, a question related to abortion and they would be more predisposed to answering strategically. Right. So let, let's say with Dr. Leah Torres, we have to be honest and, and say that she is predisposed to denying the humanity of a fetus. Full stop. Right. And that there, there's nothing uh, interesting you know what? She, or mystical she, about that. She uh, it's, is, pro it's probably fair to say she's predisposed. Uh, but the reality is that she doesn't. She well, she vastly I've had a lot of conversations with her and there are times where like I'll finally be able to nail her down. And then yeah. she waffles back. She, uh, she, yeah, it's probably fair to say what she does is she ignores the question and goes, it doesn't matter. And it's it's pretty difficult uh, for somebody to ignore a question like that when I'm when I'm pressing them. And that's why I am ultimately able to. I've had her finally admit that it is a human and ostensibly that abortion is a form of homicide, you know, a few different occasions. But then basically, Great. once I speak to her again, it starts all over. And that's because you, you know, got a you got a photo screenshot that. And <laughs> oh, trust me, I have. I think so, quote. You know, so uh, you, you you would take you back to the questions yeah. had to sort out what their their strategic try and filter out their strategic inclinations. That's exactly right, and that's because I'm trying to engage them as scientists, right? So I'm yeah. trying to put it in the most scientific elicit their objectivity. Possible. Yeah, right. And it, why why even say human being? That that injects enough ambiguity where it's like. Well, it might be a human from a scientific perspective, but human being isn't a, psych a scientific term. So no, it's not a human being, but it is a human. You know, so w when I when I frame these questions, it really got to the heart of, from a biological perspective, is a, is a mammalian zygote a member of that mammalian species, right? So that, that would have been one of the more abstract framings of the question. And then one of the more explicit ones would be from a biological perspective, is a, a, a fetus a human? You know, is, is a human zygote because it has human DNA and it's developing in the human life cycle, is that a human? And overwhelmingly biologists were willing to affirm this frame that uh, basically, you know, it's not only the statement that uh, a human zygote is a human at fertilization, but there's also the very logic, the basis for this contention is that the reason a human zygote is a human is because it has human DNA and it is developing in the human life cycle. So that applies for all humans, whether it's a, a Asian 70 year old person or it's a 10 day old uh, embryo on based on the virtue that they have human DNA and they're developing in the human life cycle, they're a human. Right. Yeah. So you say overwhelmingly, what percentage of biologists uh, agree that each human life begins at fertilization? So uh, in my dissertation, I ended up publishing that 96% affirm that a human's life begins at fertilization. And this was using these five different framings of the question because there were some who affirmed one item and not the other. Uh, in the strictest measure, when I, I looked at um, those who answered consistently on all five questions, as well as an essay question on when, on when a human's life begins, I found that 97% answered consistently that it's a human and only 3%, only 33 biologists consistently rejected those items and suggested that a fetus wasn't a human. Wow. Um, so, what I then need to know is how many biologists did you ask? What was their demographic randomization? Uh, and were they from any notable universities? Right. So this was uh, an interesting project for me. I actually spent over 500 hours going to the wow. academic department's websites 
So I had friends who suggested I could do, you know, some kind of algorithm to try to crawl the web for the contact information. I felt like if I was going to engage these professors and ask them for minutes of their time, I should at least have the commitment to see their faces, find their uh, their email addresses, and address them personally. So I, I went through um, what ended up being over 1,500 universities around the world. I had uh, gone to you know Chinese university websites, and I'd have to translate their biology faculty web pages to be able to understand what their names were and how to address them in the emails. So I ended up with a list of over 60,000 biologists from wow. practically every university you've ever heard of, everyone I could uh, get my fingers on. And uh, over 7,000 had responded in some way to the survey. And my ultimate finding was over 5,500 had either affirmed or rejected the view that a, a human's life begins at fertilization. So uh, of those who had actually affirmed the view, Harvard, Yale, Oxford, Cambridge, just every every school you can you can imagine had uh, a representative that had you know participated in my survey. Um, and how many nations uh, did the universities end up coming from? So in terms of the birth, because there was all different ways of studying this, it was over 86 uh, different countries. Um, it was every continent re uh, represented. You know, I, I didn't have mm -hmm. as many scholars from uh, Africa per se, but then I had, you know, plenty from North America, from Australia, from China, from around the world. And not surprisingly, over 85% identified as pro-choice. I believe hmm. it was ninety-two percent. That's pretty much the uh, inclination of most academia these days, is left that's, of center. That's right. In, in North America, ninety-two percent were Democrats. Um, these were your typical left-leaning. So, if the deck was stacked, it was oh, stacked against the the finding that you may have preferred with your latent bias. Right. Yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, if if, if it was going to be a, a fair study where both sides are equally represented, it would have been very different. But even with that, you know, clear bias uh, from an ideological perspective, mm. it was still overwhelming. And there so whatever, was whatever bias you brought to the table, it was countered by the, the mix of, of those. That, so the sample that you had had That's the clearly opposite bias to you. Oh, it, absolutely. And uh, I mean, I had so many biologists answer the survey and affirm that it's a human and then send me a long email about how important abortion is, that this allowed them to have the career that they wanted if they hadn't personally had an abortion. And I had people calling me a zygote worshiper and saying that I was going to facilitate the end of the world because we're so <laughs> overpopulated. And if, if abortion does oh, that old chestnut. <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't control population growth. That's only centuries old, that one. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> That's a that's a prophecy that's been failing for a very long time. And hey, one day, sure one day they'll get it right. Right? Are you familiar with? Uh, I believe the book's name is uh, Empty Planet, and they actually predict that we're going to peak at eight billion within the next century, and then we're going to plummet down to three billion, and it's just going to continue to uh, crater from there. I mean, that's that's. How, the when was that published? Uh, that was within the last couple of years. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, no, I'm not familiar with that one, but there was the one in the 60s. Uh, I can't remember his oh, name. Sure. Yeah. Um, that, that was a big one. Uh, but then um, wasn't it Malthus, uh, old yeah. philosopher, Malthus, who first said uh, we're going to overpopulate and everything's going to be terrible, and then the Industrial Revolution happened and everything was great. <laughs> and then we still had the Neo-Malthusians in the 1960s pushing abortion. And that's actually what Ruth uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg has suggested, that she always <laughs> thought of the abortion debate as a matter of population control. Oh, so desired outcomes as opposed to actual uh, understanding and reading of law. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> An activist by admission. Uh, right. Not that we needed her to admit it. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, let's see. What should we what have we covered? Uh, oh, yes. Um, I am interested. You, you just touched on it a little bit. Some people who answered one way or the other, and then, um, and and then wrote a <laughs> an opinion on yeah. on the abortion debate, which which was great. Not requested, but um, <laughs> I guess a testament to the fact that their answers were very reliable because they do affirm that life begins at yeah. fertilization uh, even while 
uh, affirming a pro-abortion um, apologetic. Um, so my question then is how big and varied was the pushback to your thesis? Uh, you had um, uh, you had the first supervisor say, no, you can't do this, too, too um, controversial. Um, so then when you got permission to go out there, how much of a controversy did it create? How much um, did you cop any, um, I guess, consequences? Did you get in trouble for it? Uh, was it just um, criticism in an echo chamber or, or how fierce and severe was it? So my study was shut down five different times while wow. my study. So this was, uh, I, would, I would send out emails to professors and then within a couple days, my uh, university's ethics committee, which had already approved my study, would shut it down. And basically they had received such a pushback from many of the biologists who, let's just say um, their ideological biases were activated when they were asked this question, uh, this scientific, really simplistic question. And that was what was interesting, how many biologists, some would say, this is such an elementary question. We all know this answer. We've known it since the 1800s. You've practically wasted my time in even asking it. And then the other side makes it out to be that I'm pushing some agenda. You know, I've had people suggest that it seemed like the survey was written by a member of the KKK or Donald Trump. I mean, just the most absurd accusations coming from these very educated. I mean, if you're if you have if you're a professor in biology, we're looking at at least ten years in uh, post high school education. I mean, these are very otherwise impressive people as scientists. Mm. And to see them being brought down by such a simple question, and I think it, you know, I, and I, I talk about this in my dissertation and some of the pieces I've written, it, it really signals how motivated their reasoning is. That uh, another way of framing it is they're basically thinking about abortion in such a way that protects their identity. And that's kind of what I was getting at with Dr. Torres. So you have to think about if you admit that a fetus is a human, then you're admitting that abortion is a form of homicide. A very it's, confronting reality. Oh, right. It's it's the killing of a human, right? So like, like I had suggested earlier, you know, when you say that um, 56 million humans are killed in abortion each year, if you have to recognize them as humans, then you have to recognize it as the, the most prolific form of death that we have. But yeah. if you deny right, right. the fetus is humanity, it's just clumps of cells being removed, and it's no different than removing tumors from humans. So yep. basically what's going on for these people is if they admit that a fetus is a human and abortion is a form of homicide, they're at risk of giving over to their conscience, of making that logical inference that abortion should be restricted, at least in some cases, which really risks their identity, because this, this is so wrapped up in one's identity as either a Democrat or as a liberal, because it really is the crown jewel of the left right now. I mean, there is no more sacred issue than abortion. I mean, there, there are Democrats who support all kinds of things, but there are no, there, there's practically no more pro-life Democrats. And we've actually seen this in America. I've actually heard there's a, a significant number. Um, I thought there was something like a third of a third of the Democrat members uh, party uh, were essentially pro-life. Right. So I'm, I'm talking in terms of elected representatives. OK. Yeah, sorry. So well, I don't even know how you could be pro-life and a member of the Democrat Party with their platform. I guess uh, blissful ignorance. Um, I don't mean to be cynical or snide. I, I, I mean, they literally don't know what the Democrat platform is and they just, you know, vote for Obama because he's black uh, or, or something equally shallow and... Um, willfully ignorant, just. Well, there's also the matter of misrepresentation by the media, right? So I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but there's a bit of an issue with bias in the media in America. I, I'm no, not sure no. I'm across not that. <laughs> so uh, even recently, there was a piece by the Washington Post, I'm not sure if you'd uh, seen this, that they suggested that the Democratic platform actually supports pain-capable legislation and banning abortion after 20 weeks which is the most absurd contention. And we've had a lot of pro-lifers push back on that and call for a retraction. And last I checked, Washington Post still hadn't done that. So it's even the matter of a lot of these pro-life Democrats, 
they might not be fully apprised of just how pro-abortion the Democrats are. Because, I mean, if you look at the Democratic convention the other week, they didn't even talk about abortion. Where, whereas that was a rallying cry in the past, they their victory has been so total that they feel there's just no use in, in showing it that? just how radical it's been. What's is that? it that or is it that that they're that smug and confident with it um, that their platform is so well known and established, or is it that it's become a bit of a liability? Uh, is that wishful thinking well, think on my it part? Is a liability. That's that's the yeah. Sorry if I uh, framed it in a confusing way, but that's the very reason is that oh, they, right. they they have had their victory, so there there really is no need for them to keep pushing. I mean, you look at Illinois; they basically eliminated all pro life legislation. Over the last few decades, New York, Virginia, I mean, they, they're, they, what they frame as their attempt to codify Roe, they're really removing any protections for fetuses and any protections. See, I would have thought if there, was a, if there wasn't a mood amongst the population that was changing and becoming uncomfortable with the violation of human rights that is mm -hmm. perpetuated by the likes of Planned Parenthood, then I would have thought if that wasn't the case, the ascendant sentiment... Yeah, that the Democrats would come out and go, our rights are under attack. You have to donate oh, and right. vote to us. Um, right. And you're so saying I it didn't even get a mention. So I'm thinking that's a temperature, uh, taking the temperature on the nation. They're like, we've got more to lose by mentioning this than to gain. That's absolutely right. Yeah. I'm in complete agreement with that. I, I think that they know that uh, if you look at polling, very few people support abortion that is... Uh, taxpayer funded throughout pregnancy. That, and that, conversely, that, Trump has looked at uh, probably the, his polling. There's no probably about it. Mm -hmm. um, and he's come out hard trying to advertise in big flashing headlines. I mean, just uh, in the most recent uh, episode of one of our shows by a commentator called Lyle Shelton, he mm -hmm. plays um, the speech from Donald Trump accepting the uh, nomination of his party mm -hmm. and um and he and Donald Trump's speech is all about how extreme, how radical, oh. how unmitigated a gross human rights violation the Democrat platform is when it comes to the topic of abortion. Um, so he's clearly saying there's something in this nation which is going to favor pro-life um, uh, and not pro-abortion uh, politicians. Right. I mean, not a single Democratic <clears throat> senator supported the Born Alive Protection Act, which basically provided for a five-year sentence for anyone who doesn't report uh, the denial of services to a, a newborn who survived an abortion. Yep. So Elizabeth Warren made this out to be something that was denying women's rights. This wasn't even about abortion. This was yep. about what happens after a, an infant survives an abortion and they push back against that? And that's what yeah. was so ludicrous about uh, the Washington Post suggestion that somehow Democrats are very uh, moderate on abortion and that they allow for restrictions after 20 weeks. They won't even allow for the protection of born alive infants. Yep. So they barely even yeah. moderate, moderate like Moloch. Right. Um, Donald Trump, he absolutely is the most pro-life president. When we talked about human rights, what I like to harken back to is his speech at the United Nations when he basically pointed his finger at these global bureaucrats and told them that they have no right to tell sovereign nations that they don't have the right to protect prenatal life. And, you know, he spoke at the March for Life. I, I was there. It was, it was a very... Uh, I'll have to come to that one day. One year. Yeah. Oh, def definitely. And he's uh, he he recently suggested that he's going to do everything in his power to protect prenatal life. Uh, and even when you brought up Dred Scott, there was a professor, Professor Pecknold, who recently suggested what's called the Lincoln proposal. And he wants Donald Trump to follow in uh, President Lincoln's footsteps that President Lincoln actually issued, um, I believe it was passports to slaves at the time going against the Dred Scott decision. So what Professor Pecknold is suggesting is that Donald Trump should declare prenatal humans, all fetuses, persons within the meaning of the 14th Amendment, and that this would be a huge boon for the pro-life movement. And I mean, I, I couldn't imagine anything I would want more. It would be a huge step forward. And I think it would cement his legacy as 
the defender defender of prenatal life that uh, President Lincoln was for uh, slaves. I, I think it could be a, a really important move. And I, I hope Donald Trump, that the pro-life movement continues pushing him and emboldening him to be the defender of uh, you know, unborn rights. So the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, 1868, granted citizenship to, quote, all persons born or naturalized in the United States, end quote, which included former slaves recently freed. So obviously they wouldn't be born uh, would you have to amend the amendment to say all persons conceived or would you have to naturalize? Like, how so, do you make that work under the 14th Amendment? Right. So the 14th Amendment, this is actually a big uh, area of uh, uh, confusion for a lot of people. So the, the simplest question is this. Do you think the 14th Amendment applies to immigrants or those who are in the country illegally? Citizenship. Um, I actually don't know the. I'm, I'm just yeah, doing so Google. Right. I, don't, I don't mean uh, to test you, but basically, no, no. Test, was, test me. This is fine. I like it. Um, I love <laughs> well, America. I love it law. Does um, it, it if, it, if it's to, about citizenship, I would say no. So it actually doesn't require citizenship. It applies to okay. all humans within the jurisdiction of the no. United States. Okay. The uh, so I didn't think it granted citizenship. But sorry, right. I, I didn't think it required citizenship. I think I thought, well, what I'm reading here says it grants citizenship. Right, right. So that that's what I was saying. And I wasn't trying to imply that you were uh, one who's confused. But in my discussions about the 14th Amendment, many are confused. When they read that, they believe that you need to be born in the you need to be born and born in the United States to have the protection of the 14th Amendment when clearly that isn't the case because the 14th Amendment does apply to immigrants and to non-citizens. So once they are naturalized, it, that does not that's not required either. So okay. the, 14th, the 14th Amendment and this uh, I actually wrote a law review article that will be coming out for the Tennessee Law Review. And my argument is that... Okay, so sorry, I, yeah. I, I, I don't think enough of my viewers know what the 14th Amendment is and I'm just sure. looking it up now. And it actually says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Uh, there's dot, dot, dot. So there must be more to that. There so is. you're saying you just entered the United States and you're a citizen? No, I'm sorry. The, my, what uh, my analysis has nothing to do with citizenship. It, it has to do with whether or not one can avail themselves of the protection of the Fourteenth Amendment. So basically, if you read the Fourteenth Amendment, it it provides uh, the guarantee of life, liberty to all humans within the jurisdiction of the United States. That makes now, sense. Now, others try to seize. You have human on, rights, whether you're born here or not. Exactly. And they, they try to seize on the language of person in the 14th Amendment. However, if you look back to those who ratified the 14th Amendment in the 19th century, and it's uh, Senator Trumbull, Senator Jacob Howard, they're, you know, in, in my piece, and uh, another person who's written on this a lot is uh, Josh Craddock. So he famously had. Uh, I'd actually like you to send that to me, and, and I'll reprint that piece because it'd be good to, yeah, to share and, that. Uh, so people watching this can then refer to it. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, he had a piece come out for the Harvard uh, Journal of Law and Public Policy, where he also makes the case that prenatal humans are persons within the meaning of the Fourteenth Amendment. But basically, contemporary senators in the fourteen in the in the nineteenth century, they made it clear that. The 14th Amendment applies to all weak and helpless human beings. And then there's even been Supreme Court justices who've come out and said that people understood the 14th Amendment to apply to all humans. And even justices in Roe v. Wade, in subsequent cases, they said that if there is no fundamental and well-recognized difference between a fetus and a human, then not only could states not permit abortion, but they would be required to restrict abortion by the 14th Amendment. So basically what, what this whole debate comes down to is, if a fetus is a human, it is deserving of constitutional rights and constitutional protections. And then the second step would be, how do those rights compare to a pregnant woman's rights? And basically what has been put forth by Roe v. Wade. So it said that if personhood is established, 
that the case for abortion rights collapses. So uh, based on the logic of Roe, Roe was essentially premised on the notion that fetuses weren't humans. Mm. They, they suggested themselves that if you could establish that a fetus is a human, that the case for abortion rights collapses. And that's another reason why not only from a discursive perspective in terms of the debate, but from a legal perspective, if you could prove fetuses are humans, if, if the Supreme Court takes judicial notice of the scientific consensus on when life mm. begins, Really, the, the debate is over. It, it is the case. And that's then the question, because obviously, as your research show, shows, um, that, that conversation is well and truly finished. It, right. it takes and a great deal of prejudice to ignore um, the, the observable, describable condition and, and process of when each human life begins. Right. And uh, there are many pro-choice people who do admit this. So uh, this might be useful for you. Roe v. Wade is anachronistic. It's just, it's oh, done. There's and that, cobwebs that, all over it. That's really what my law review article is. Uh, I make the argument that you should actually see Roe v. Wade as a situational uh, finding, a context-dependent finding that was based on the reality in 1973. And they said it themselves. They said they didn't know when life began based on the development of man's knowledge at that time. So they were willing to consider that we would one day determine that it was a human. And, and that appropriate amount of humility, which would be good today. Right. And uh, so pro-choice people do admit this. Margaret Sanger, Alan Guttmacher. Uh, if you actually go to whendoeslifebegin.org, this is a website I put together with Illinois Right to Life. And there's over uh, 100 sources on when life begins from scientists, from pro-life people, from pro-choice people, from legal sources. And there are just dozens of pro-choice people who admit that a fetus is a human, that abortion is killing, but they then try to deny that either a fetus is a person because they use like a philosophical perspective on what a person is, or they try to make the claim that a woman's right to her body is absolute. And that even if a fetus is a human person, it has no rights. But as I suggested, the Roe v. Wade had rejected that. They actually had considered that. They said that uh, the attorneys for Roe and some uh, briefs suggested that the right to abortion should be absolute. And they said with that, they do not agree. So one thing to look at is actually Germany. So Germany for decades. That's really, that's, I, I just want to pause on that. Oh, please, that's, yes. that that's just profound that the justices said that uh, that should be what um, pro human rights people are, are trumpeting whenever oh. Roe v. Wade is brought up is hang on. Um, do, do, I, I want to highlight that in your article. I'm going to make that a heading paragraph. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just, this is what the justices said. They, they said there is no such thing as an absolute right. So if you want to right. claim Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade all day long, well, one, 96% of biologists agree each human life begins at fertilization. That question, raised as relevant by Roe v. Wade, yeah. uh, which you and I'm saying is something we should be listening to. Okay, let's listen to it. Right. That question's answered. Number two, there is no absolute right to abortion. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, uh, and this is philosophy, not science, uh, but I think the umbilical cord um, doesn't diminish the human rights no. Uh, it actually enhances the duty of care. Exactly. And, and I like your framing of duty of care. I think that's something very useful when people make the autonomy argument, when they suggest that a woman has an absolute right to bodily autonomy. One has to consider what happens when she ha has sex, when she creates a human. I mean, this is akin to a doctor consenting to perform in uh, a, a surgery and then in the middle of the surgery, suggesting that he withdraws his consent. No, no court of law would allow for that because I'm not fond of arguments that make a window for for the the consent at sex because it opens the window for the rape for exception. Yeah. And and sure. and the the human rights of the preborn living human yeah. um, are not diminished by the circumstances of its conception. Yeah. I, I think I think that's fundamental to the inherent nature of human rights. They are inherent, not contextual. Right, and, and with that, uh, I end up pivoting to the notion of what if it is that you wake up in bed with an infant next to you? 
do you have the right to walk away from that infant because you see yourself as having taken no action to induce the reliance of that infant on you? Or yep. do you have a legal obligation to ex expend the minimal amount of effort to get it protected, to drop it off at a police station or, or yep. give over custody to somebody else? And, and, I, and if you were a nine month walk away from any care, right, you would still not be justified in saying uh, it's assaulting me and I'm therefore going to kill it. Yes. <laughs> that would just be ridiculous. Of and course, it's a drain on your resources right. and your body, uh, just like the child will be for the next 21 years to the father's yeah. body with child support if he doesn't want it. But, um, you know, that's your duty of care. Um, this this is humanity. This is this is the fundamental obligation that we have to each other. Right. Um, this, this is what makes us human and not animals. Exactly. And, and that's why I try not to get too much in the thought experiments and the, because anytime you move it from what is a very clear cut case, which is there being legal responsibilities. The other thing is, I mean, what I think is useful when you think about abortion is to just recognize that if it is a human, a homicide is the killing of a human by another human. In our law, there needs to be a justification for a homicide. That's the only way that a homicide can be legal is if there's an affirmative defense. In the case of abortion, what would the, be the affirmative defense? Yeah. Th this person is literally killing another human being. This is not a matter of walking away from an infant. This is not a matter of having an intense surgery that safely removes the fetus so it could survive outside of the womb for as long as it wants. No, those doctors are intentionally going into the womb and yep. causing the death of that fetus. So what would be the justification? And based on my analysis of the laws from uh, you know, the international community and throughout history, the only justification is self-defense. And that's why we have life of the mother exceptions. So while the pro-life movement pushes back on whether or not it's the case that there's ever a situation in which an abortion would be medically necessary to save a woman's life, there's a reason why laws today... Well, and this is where we come down to the intent. Uh, if your intent is to save the life of the mother, then right. I argue that's no longer a direct abortion. If we need to modify the language to clarify the objection... It's yeah. the voluntary, elective, desired exactly. outcome of the death of the child that is the problem. But it's still a homicide. I think it's worth still calling out, even if it is yes. to save the life of the woman, it's a homicide. It's just a justifiable homicide because of the right to self-defense. Legally, technically, yeah. fair. <laughs> um, pro probably not uh, prosecutable in in what, uh, I don't know if, if Americans have this uh, uh, saying, but in Australia we have the saying, the pub test. Um, okay, what's this? Yeah, uh, that, that that's if you know if you if you uh, Americans call it the bar. If you're at sure. the bar, the hotel, um, the pub in Australia, um, you know, and you just ask anybody, and and they um, and you know what what are they going to say uh, with, without getting too complicated? Does it does it sound right, yeah. or or does it sound like? Uh, you know, <laughs> come on, mate, you're having a lend. <laughs> in, in America, we call that the smell test. The sniff test, yeah, that's yeah, another the one. Sniff test. Yeah, there you go. Um, so yeah, that that would be uh, that would be that that there. So yeah, I don't I don't think the calling uh, you know, the the necessary choice between the mother or the baby's life a, a justifiable homicide. That, it would be technically accurate, but it wouldn't pass muster. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think uh, part of part of uh, my impetus is just the the sensitivity to the fact that this is the killing of a human. I I think we should never bristle from that fact. However, I yeah, mean, yeah, and that's and that's and look, this is how I do pass the sniff test, and and that is, um, what are you trying to do? If you're trying to save the mother, right. then try and save the child as well. Sure, and and do everything you can to do that. And so, in the case of preeclampsia. Uh, an abortion is not going to be an emergency solution. No. Um, a cesarean is going to be an emergency solution. Exactly. So if you're trying to save the life of the mother, which is just about the most common circumstance, you know, preeclampsia is the most common circumstance where you might need to consider terminating the pregnancy. You do that by delivering the baby, not by killing the baby. Exactly. Um, you can use and, an abortion method. 
you wouldn't use what are typically seen as the abortion methods for that. Now. Correct. Correct. Right. And, uh, and, and, you know, the, another perfect example of anti-abortion laws not being bad for women is the fact that anti-abortion strongly Catholic Ireland uh, until they legalized abortion um, had a much better maternal mortality rate mm. than pro-abortion America. Interesting. Uh, it, it just wasn't the case right. that anti-abortion laws were adverse to the outcomes of maternal mortality. Right. Um, you, you act, uh, for some reason, America is much lower than the developed nation average for maternal mortality. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I typically look to our obesity rates. Um, you know, others imply poverty, but I think what's driving a lot of that is our obesity rates. Interesting. Um, yeah. And that's that's kind of like the when I, I recently spoke with a law professor who's a, an expert on abortion laws about this. And uh, sh she had said she had never heard this suggested. I think it's kind of the, you know, no pun intended, the elephant in the room that at the end <laughs> of the day when there when there's higher rates, you know, and I, I'm not a thin guy myself. I'm, I'm just willing to call call a thing a thing. And when you have those higher obesity rates, it just causes pregnancy complications. You play football? Preeclampsia back in the day, a little submission wrestling too. Yeah, I'm a bigger <laughs> dude. Um, so, and that's something that we just, you know, there. I yield. <laughs> no, no. There's a whole host of health issues that Americans yeah. face due to our diet. I mean, some have described us as overfed and malnourished. That you know, if you look at our diet and our carbs. I think it wasn't too diet. long ago. It might have been ten years ago. I can can remember Australia's. Um, Average obesity was bigger than America's, um, so we're we're up there competing oh, with you. Yeah, as you. However, know. however, our maternal mortality rate is is maybe maybe half America's. Yeah, um, I think we're point zero zero five percent, and you guys are like point zero zero one two. Um, yeah. Last time I looked up the data, um, which, hmm. by the way, is about the same risk as dying in a fatal car accident when you hop in the car, go around the corner, and buy some milk. Um, you know, and and so. Uh, another thing that you know Leah tried to argue with me was that every pregnancy is a risk to the mother, um, and that's just statistically not true. Um, in risk of every, stretch, yeah, she says everyone is medically indicated. I mean, she suggests as long as no, there's no, a higher she, rate of dying in an abortion in in pregnancy and childbirth than abortion, she sees as every single abortion as medically necessary. Is what so she lo logical contortionism, which would never pass a triage no. um, ethics exam. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously you don't kill some anyway, um, it's just <laughs> beyond, beyond, beyond ridiculous, um, <clears throat> contemptible assertion. Um, that is, it's not even attempting to be sincere. Um, and, 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 and look at the incentive. What, what reason does she have to be sincere? I mean, I, I think that we, well, I like to, I like to grant the benefit of that doubt. And, and the yeah. reason we had an hour long interview was because I wasn't trying to embarrass her and, and oh, we were trying to just have a dialogue and um, and it wasn't about gotcha it was you know let's test each other's ideas yeah. and um, and and that was that was important um, and I, I do that all the time um, but um, you know I, I think I, just to try and bring this home because we're a bit over an hour now and, and that's okay because it's a really great conversation but oh, really enjoyed it um, I think there's only uh, I think anybody that is still pro-abortion mm -hmm. after they acknowledge all the facts um, that they acknowledge that they're killing a living human uh, if they assert that a woman's rights are absolute a woman's autonomy is absolute even at the mortal cost of somebody else's life I, I think the reality is that's probably not something we can counter we just have to acknowledge is an extreme and radical position that is anti-human rights, uh, mm -hmm. and um, all. And then they're clearly not pro-human rights. At best, they could describe themselves uh, euphemistically as pro pro-woman rights, right. um, and that then needs to be clarified is at the cost of all others. Yeah. I mean, based on the human rights calculation, there really is no way to defend elective abortion. I mean, this is akin to human sacrifice. Even if you believe 100%. that one has uh, the, the right to practice their religion, we all recognize that there's a hierarchy of rights such that you cannot kidnap 
another human to sacrifice them, claiming that your right to practice your religion is more important than their right to life. So the right to autonomy, the right to make medical decisions, these things are all secondary to the right to life of somebody else. And when I surveyed Americans, I actually found that they did say this. So even pro-choice people admitted that the right to life- I hate using that term. I, I, I hate cooperating with their euphemisms. You're not pro-choice. Oh, I know. When, yeah. It, when you're pro one choice, there yeah. is no choice. You're just pro-abortion. That's that's a really fair pushback. I I, I still have. Uh, you feel I, you need to play nice with their language? Well, at the, I mean, when I was in my PhD program, I mean, that's one thing we didn't get to. The fact that uh, not only was my study shut down five times, my advisor threatened to leave my project and said that I couldn't continue my study because he didn't want to sign off on a project that would produce data that members of the pro-choice, pro-life movement could use. So I, I literally had to shift advisors in the middle of a research project. And this was after I had to ask, you know, several different uh, professors to step up and support my research after he abandoned me. So you have no idea what the politics were, how difficult it was. I, I mean, I had to basically- I'm happy to explore that a little bit more. We didn't really get into the full details of that. If you want to talk about that a bit more, you, five times you got canceled, shut down. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was the case that I would sit in the room with my advisor who himself had made, made a name for himself defending female genital modification. So he's basically the father of cultural relativism, uh, you know, cultural pluralism is how he liked to frame it. And here I was, I worked as his teaching assistant for five years. He, he knew what my priors were. You know, when I started the project, I told him, I believe abortion is a human rights violation. Uh, I went through the calculus and he said, you know, who says human rights even matter? Because he had written many pieces decrying the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I said, you know, that that's my prior. I, I'm not saying that human rights is absolutely the way we should move forward, but it is the way that both sides agree on. So I, when I surveyed Americans, I asked them, do you believe in these principles of the Human Rights uh, Declaration? And 97% said that they believe that all humans deserve the right to life, all humans are equally deserving of rights, so that is why that was the playing field I wanted to use. Like you had yeah. said, that's what uh, pro-abortion people assent to. So uh, he knew all of that. But once he saw how hot things were getting, once he was threatened himself. So I actually had professors write letters to him and suggest that he had done something unethical by even supporting my project. And unfortunately... Uh, you know, the water got a little too hot for him, and that caused him to pressure me to to give up on my project. He wanted me to stop collecting data when I was only 20% of the way done. When I had only had a thousand respondents, he said, you're not continuing. Uh, I'm going." He even suggested that he would recommend that I not receive my PhD. I mean, there were biologists calling for me to be kicked out of my department. That, I, that my project wasn't deserving of a PhD. So there was there were just so so much politics and and so many things I had to do basically to to survive in that world and and I mean as a mediator you can't really go about uh, saying what is the most correct term when that would seem uh, ideologically slanted even though let's be clear that's what all of the news uh, agencies do. So when you look at their style mm -hmm. guides, they recommend that you call supporters of abortion rights, uh, abortion rights advocates. And then when you describe pro-life people, you're supposed to call them abortion opponents, which I, I never thought made sense. Why don't we? I'm happy with that. I'm happy with that. Well, I am anti-abortion. No, and you're if, a fetal rights advocate. <laughs> I'm just, no, you're, look, you don't think some, you're, an, you're a human rights advocate? You're, you're uh, I'm, I'm also a human rights advocate. I'm also anti-slavery because it's it's good for all of them. I 100% nail me to the cross. I'm anti-abortion. <laughs> I'm anti-homicide. I'm anti-mass yeah, murder. I'm anti-female no. genital mutilation. I'm anti-rape. Right. I'm, that's uh, very purposeful. They're trying to frame you in a negative way to make it seem like I'm happy to wear it. Harsh. Well, there you go. But so I'm happy Andy, to wear it. I'm, I'm anti-abortion. Right. Bring it on. And my generation Johnson, will make sure that there is no such thing as a pro-abortion candidate ever again uh, that you 
my mm, trying. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> Abby Abby Johnson, when she gave her speech at the Republican National Convention, they I think they had described her on the Chiron as an opponent of abortion rights. I understand that you do, you know, you, you are anti-abortion, but that framing makes it seem like somebody is a draconian anti-human rights person. The, look, I, I actually think the right strategy here is to run towards that slingshot around the sun. Um, just absolutely, I'm anti-abortion rights. That's like being anti-slavery rights. Thank you very much. You've acknowledged my ethics, my morality, my humanity, and uh, you've, you've, <laughs> thank you, 100%. And that, anybody and who disagrees right. with me is pro-abortion rights. Are you kidding? Right. How embarrassing, how humiliating do you even sleep straight in bed at night? Like, <laughs> Well, when oh, you get on. into the subtleties of persuasion, I mean, it's one of those things for those who aren't thinking very carefully. This all is a culture change thing. You're against rights. And that's yep. why if you're going to be fair, what it should be is you support fetal rights and they support abortion rights. I mean, I, I think from a logical perspective, if you were truly trying to make it neutral, yeah. you would recognize that both sides are supporting rights. Both sides are human rights advocates. It's just, of course, is where, where you're 100% right is that um, I may not get the opportunity to correct the narrative or oh, to balance the narrative. Uh, we'll <laughs> only have their framing of it and yeah. the perception that people are left with. You are 100% right. Uh, and it is intended to be oh. weaponized as a pejorative. Um, Indeed. Yeah. And, and nevertheless, uh, shows like this exist to say, let's change the culture. If we have to move a millimeter, a day, let's start. Right. Let's start. Sorry, millimeter, a uh, sixteenth of an inch. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> uh, if we have to do that, uh, great. Let's start. William Wilberforce took a whole generation to end slavery. Uh, yep. This is not going to happen in an election cycle, mm -hmm. but my generation will end abortion. Uh, that 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 will happen, um, and I'm happy for uh, not happy, but uh, satisfied. Um, if it takes the next generation to finish the job. But we're starting now. And that's uh, what matters, right, is that we win. So slavery was with us for thousands of years. Yes, the abolitionists, it didn't end quickly enough for them, but it ended. And what, you know, and while, you know, obviously it, it rises up in certain pockets, and it's probably the case that you can never eliminate any human behavior mm. just because humans are so robust, they're so durable, they're so defiant. We could change our laws just like we did with slavery. I, I'm yep. sure there were people who said you will never end slavery, that they were even more confident that we wouldn't end sure. slavery than people today are confident that we wouldn't end abortion. Yep. And, and you know, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you. We're just going to oh, keep going until until you have to go to bed or something. Um, I'm fine. I'm happy to continue. Um, <clears throat> I, I might chop this up or I might just leave it as a long one. But um, Okay, so one of the questions I've got to ask, and I don't know if there's a good time to ask it. We might just jump around a little bit now. Uh, when I when I quote the data, your your very good, reliable um, data. Yeah. Ninety six percent of biologists agree each human life begins at fertilization. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people say, "Wow." A lot of people go, "What do the other four percent believe?" <laughs> that's right. So that that's the funny thing. Um, essentially, they are answering from this motivated reasoning perspective, right? Those 4% are typically those who are either so cynical or so nihilistic that they, they know what's going on and they do not want to be counted amongst the consensus, right? And at the end of the day, if you've done enough survey research, you realize that there's a ceiling on any question. I don't know that I would get 96% to say the sky is blue. I mean, there mm. people misread <laughs> questions. People are defiant. So, uh, but in terms of the essay question, so I what I wanted to do was get discrete data where they either affirmed or rejected a, a statement that represented the view that a human's life begins at fertilization. I also wanted to give them an open-ended essay question so I could get good qualitative data to understand why would somebody disagree. And what I saw most typically was they they would conflate, they would confuse. What is, what is the phylog, uh, phylogenetic question from the ontogenetic question, okay? So they would see it as, even though I'm asking, when does a human's life begin? 
they would confuse it and say, when did all life begin? So I actually had people responding to the question, you know, from a biological perspective, when does a human's life begin? And they would say 5.7 billion years ago. <laughs> I mean, so that's, that's a clear confusion of when did all life begin and when does a human's life begin? You know, and then Bless I their hearts. Some, Bless some this is my, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You're Illinois. Yeah, Chicago. So, where's that in the map? North, south, east, west? Oh, uh, that's Midwest. So basically Midwest. part of the country. Beneath uh, beneath halfway or mid? Uh, I would say a little above halfway. Oh, okay. Well, it's uh, one of the southern statements I like uh, okay. and I've made my own is I'll bless their hearts. <laughs> bless their hearts. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I, mean, I had some people say uh, uh, when the kids move out. You know, they're, they're just <laughs> jokers, right? Uh, when the kids move out and the dog dies. You know, and they thought they were being funny, right? When I, I can travel. <laughs> yeah, I had others say um, life never begins. It, it's one continuous chain. And it's like, yes, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of the perspective of life, that it's continued in one unbroken chain. But obviously, Dave did not exist five billion years ago. Yeah. But, as a human being, as an organism, there was a point before you existed, right? Even if there was a point where your, your mother's egg and your father's sperm existed, you did not exist as a unitary organism until fertilization. Yeah. So at, I think They're in the wrong department. They should be in the philosophical department. <laughs> well, and they were just looking for any escape hatch, any release valve, so they wouldn't have to admit because, like I said, there's such psychological consequences to have mm. to admit that a fetus is a human. And I, I really think what was going on was... My heart actually breaks. You know, when yeah. I was... Um, my heart breaks went for, for abortion providers and, and apologists. Oh, and sure. For, for the day, you know, um, uh, as I met my first abortionist, at first my skin crawled. Oh. And, and then... And then I, you know, and there's zero credit to me. This is all all praise to God. But then I was able to see them the way Jesus saw them. Mm. And I thought there's a day coming where they're going to realize the the guilt that has stained their lives. And my heart breaks for that day that could crush them. Yeah. And um, and and yeah, I just you know, and and we've seen with so many um, former abortionists. Um, and and then I felt responsibility on me. The yeah. way I converse with this person mm. uh, could could delay that day. That's true. Uh, and that puts blood on my hands. Um, I I need to hasten that day by by while being a truth loving, uncompromised witness. Mm. Um, I, I still need to love them right. uh, for who they are, not what they do. Yeah. Um, and and yeah, that that that's just that confronting truth which is why i 100 percent believe why um they contort philosophy and ethics and logic and biology um and, and as you said look for that escape hatch from from that reality and it's not only them they've been taught in this way so when i i, I give a lot of pro right. talks and I, I go around Illinois giving these uh, training seminars, basically, to help people have compassionate conversations with people in their family, in their friend group who have different uh, beliefs about abortion. And what I tell them is, this is not an opportunity to prove how smart you are or to prove how wrong they are. Mm -hmm. That this is an opportunity to educate them, to provide them with a perspective or a set of facts that they either haven't been exposed to based on their experiences or they haven't been able to understand and, and admit because of their own psychological costs to recognizing it. So when I when I talk to these people, I try to tell them that, you know, you also shouldn't feel defensive. If an eight-year-old calls you a duty head, there's no reason you should feel threatened by that, right? Mm. Similarly, when you have somebody who you know, unfortunately, is not understanding the facts and they cannot recognize the science because the the costs are too great 
you shouldn't feel threatened when they try to insult you or they try to distract the conversation. You should just stick on the topic. And this is, you know, for those who are Christians, you know, in, evangel in, in uh, evangelism, they say, stay on the cross, right? Don't get distracted when they want to say, well, what about this sin? And what about this? And why does God do this? Stay on the cross. For, for the pro-life movement, I tell them, stay on the humanity of the fetus. They're going mm -hmm. to do everything they can to move away from that realization, but you just need to stay on that. And you need to do so compassionately because let's face it, most of these people who support abortion, they didn't understand that it was a human and it was a homicide and then one day changed their mind for financial reasons. You know, there wasn't a fracture in their personality. They were raised believing this. I mean, we yeah. have generations of people, even though in 1828, that was when it was first discovered that a fetus was a human at fertilization. Really? I mean, yeah. How did they discover that? Was that was that with microscopes or before? Carl von Ernst Baer, uh, I believe it was theoretical at first. So he had actually seen enough data that he was able to extrapolate from it and realize that we all started off as a zygote, that all mammalian organisms do. And then wow. it was later confirmed with that would have been a lot of postmortems. Yeah. Um, so Dr. Alan Guttmacher, the namesake of the Guttmacher Institute, which is the research arm of Planned Parenthood, uh, he, I, I believe, in one of his quotes, he said, "It's difficult to imagine a time when people didn't understand that a fetus was a human." I mean, there are just so many quotes from even wow. abortion supporters who mm. say that, like. This is so common knowledge. I mean, there's this great article, and I could send it to you, from 1970 in the Western Journal of Medicine. It was a California medicine journal where it's abortion doctors, as the editor of this journal, contemplating how do they square the fact that abortion is killing and we have not developed our ethics to support legal killing yet. So how, how do we wrestle with the notion, how do you support abortion in a populace that doesn't support legal killing? And what they say is it, it creates this, you know, confusing of logic and, and this, you know, they, they have a lot of artful language describing, uh, what, what did they, uh, they used, uh, what was the one term? It was so interesting. But at any rate, they basically contemplate why uh, people are misled on the humanity of fetuses, and they basically suggest that this is a necessary precondition for passing permissive abortion laws. That if everybody recognizes fetuses as humans and abortion is killing, there's no way you can legalize it because we didn't have the legal concepts to allow for legal killing. So what did they do? They denied the humanity of fetuses and denied the homicidal nature of abortion. I, God forgive them. They, I mean, they they're just having this conversation. Is 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 how how do we distort reality so we can do wrong? Like we know that, what we're exactly doing is wrong. Right. That's we exactly know what we're doing is wrong. And and how do we trick everybody to say it's okay? Sorry, it's my phone going. <laughs> and it might be cynical, but what they concluded was we cannot shift our ethics. We cannot undermine human rights. So what's the clear answer? We need to deny the humanity of fetuses. And, and they felt like they were confident enough they could do that. And sure enough, all it took was a Supreme Court decision. Because when you consider the fact that, and you know, most people don't talk about this, but abortion was illegal in the United States from the 1860s to the 1960s. Every single state criminalized abortion other than for the life of the mother. And this was after Dr. Horatio Storer of the American Medical Association put together the Committee on Criminal Abortion. So it was actually our medical association that went state by state uh, advocating for these restrictive abortion laws. So you have to consider, like, if you're in if you're in 1973 and you're like, wait, abortion is illegal throughout this country because it's the killing of a human, right? That's how they all understood it. But then Roe v. Wade says. Well, actually, we don't know when a human's life begins. And now here we are less than 50 years later, and only 23% of supporters of abortion rights know that a human's life begins at fertilization. Less really? Where's that data come from? Because I've heard, 
I've heard people in the pro-life uh, movement in Australia mm -hmm. say that they think the science argument is somewhat redundant and everybody knows that um, life begins at fertilization. So let's, but you're let's, saying only 23% of abortion supporters know that. So let's start off with I'm 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 going uphill with that in in America too. So I have bosses, I have people who tell me uh you know quite frankly that they think that the science is unnecessary that we already know it's a human everyone knows it's a human. So if you look at polling from uh, Marist, so the Knights of Columbus, they've done these polls with Marist and they have found that less than a quarter of pro-choice people recognize a fetus as a human, that uh, over half suggests that the view that a human's life begins at fertilization is a philosophical or religious belief, not a scientific and objective fact. And the 23% data, that comes from me. So I had actually surveyed thousands of Americans and I asked them, I, I even made it specific to biology. I said, from a biological perspective, when does a human's life begin? And they most frequently said viability and birth. Can you write an article on that? Or if you have already, can you share it with me? I'd, I'd love yeah. to just publish that. And just to say, hey, this is one of the places the argument is at. I won't presume it's where it's at. But, um, you know, this is an argument we still need to prosecute. And, and that's what's so funny is I think people have been so long entrenched in the abortion debate that they feel like everybody knows it's a human. But, all, I mean, you and I know this being on Twitter. No, it's not the case. We'll have one person say everyone knows it's a human. And then the next person says, of course, it's not a human, <laughs> which is always a funny moment to see that contrast in the same conversation. Uh, yeah, but yeah. yes, I, I recently wrote a piece for Heterodox Academy, and this is kind of like a, a free thinking academic arm that allows for more controversial research. And in it, I not only argue that this is a major issue in the abortion debate, based on my studies, it's actually the central issue. So I basically did a cause. I've always thought so. I've always okay. thought so. Oh, I've always I, thought so. Absolutely. Surely, and I can't remember who said it. It might have been um, Equal Rights Institute, one of those mm -hmm. guys. But uh, I think somebody said, look, the abortion debate reduces to two possibilities. You're either anti-science or you're anti-human rights. That's right. I, I think that's 100% right. And that's what I found is when I talk to people and I bring this scientific perspective, I either get them denying the science or I get them to ultimately say they don't believe in human rights. Uh, so, so I think that's right spot on. And yeah, in that, in that study, I actually looked at all of the different factors for what constitutes you know, uh, a pro-life or a pro-choice belief. And I found that the main driver was their view on when life begins. So, you know, put another way, if you have an atheist who recognizes a fetus as a human, they are more likely to support abortion restrictions than somebody who is a Catholic or a Christian who believes life begins at viability. So well, this is another uh, another thing is, is that it's not a religious perspective. It's a oh, human exactly. rights, ethical, scientific perspective. And there's plenty of people with without a religious framework who are right. pro-life. I and mean, you see them on Facebook, uh, feminists for life, pagans for life, uh, yes. atheists for life. And it's like secular it, pro-life. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Why, yeah. You know, but but if you look at the data, Dave, uh, if you look at other studies, they imply that the differences between pro-life and pro-choice people is driven by um, religiosity. So they think that it's just a matter of religion. They also think that it's actually because of sexism. They use these terrible sexism measures that aren't even addressing sexism. Basically, anyone who recognizes differences between men and women is a sexist. And they use that to suggest that's what dr is driving pro-life beliefs. They say that it's right-wing authoritarianism. They, they have all these strange you know, predictors. And I found, in my study, I found the greatest causal explanation for differences between pro-life and pro-choice people and it's uh, their views on when a human's life begins. So fascinating. So interesting. Look, uh, let's wrap it up. Uh, oh, I've sure. really enjoyed chatting to you. We could probably go for another <laughs> hour and a half um, and maybe we should just do it again. Um, I would appreciate th that. This conversation just has to keep happening um, mm -hmm. because 
you know, uh, people aren't going back and watching the videos I did two years ago, uh, as evergreen as they, they may be. We just have to keep talking about it. We have to keep this conversation in front of people's uh, minds. Um, you're a leader in your field. I, I think the work you've done is uh, a watershed moment in the uh, quest for the equal access to human rights mm. for unborn people. Um, and uh, I'm really pleased to make your acquaintance face to face, as it were, continents apart. Um, and uh, yeah, we'd, we'd hopefully count you as a friend for decades to come and co belligerent in this <laughs> cause. Um, and uh, yeah, look, uh, once, once you acknowledge the humanity of the unborn child, all of the filters and exclusions uh, from this debate must fall away, uh, just as it was everybody's obligation and imperative to fight for the equality of black people. That's right. It's our obligation and imperative to fight for the justice and, and equal rights of, of uh, unborn people, preborn people. I don't like the word unborn, I like preborn. Yeah, I, I think uh, Dr. Torres has mocked that, that it almost sounds like they're zombies. And yeah, we're, we're prenatal, we're preborn. And I mean, just to your point, 56 million humans are being killed under the auspices of abortion each year. That's over a billion since the year 2000. That's double what was estimated in all human wars in, in the last 6,000 years. It's less than 500 million are it estimate who have died in war. And we're talking yep. about abortion in 20 years, we've killed double that. I mean, it is the most, as you've said, the most prolific human rights abuse, human yep. rights violation the world's ever seen. And speaking of another uh, human rights violator, uh, well, speaking of, of those kind of numbers, another human rights violator uh, quoted, um, one death, one human death is a tragedy. A million is a statistic. And of course, that was Joseph Stalin. Mm. Um, and, and there's a fair equation between his death toll and the abortion industry, um, al although the abortion industry probably embarrasses him for insufficiency. Um, and look, uh, that individual story is the one I just want to finish on this note of, of empathy and mm -hmm. compassion for women who have in the past or maybe even now find themselves in a situation where they believe and sincerely feel there is no other choice. Yeah. Um, I, I can't relate to that. Um, but uh, just know that there is a lot of support for you that offers no judgment. If you need healing um, and counselling for the trauma suffered from a past abortion, my heart breaks for you and I really want you to find that. Um, if you reach out to me, I'm happy to point you to some people, but Google will definitely help you. Uh, Post-abortion trauma counselling. Um, it will be free, it will be confidential, it will be qualified and competent and they will help you without judgment. Uh, and if you're facing that kind of decision at the moment, please know you have more than one choice and uh, and the right choice is is the way God designed you. And but more important than that is is you don't have to make that choice alone. There is support for you uh, that won't be coercive or pressuring. Um, and it's super important uh, that you reach out for help and and allow, uh, people to to be able to contact me, uh, contact Steve, um, and and we would be very happy to point you in the right direction if if your search engine doesn't give you a, an easy quick answer. Um, but uh, yeah, know that we're praying for you because uh, the the evil enemy here is not the woman, not the mother, uh, not even um, the abortionist. It's the industry and the idea, and we have to oppose and defeat that so that the whole generation knows and promotes the equality, liberty, justice, and peace of, of all members of the human family, Amen. As, as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says. Uh, Steve Jacobs, thank you so much for your time. Where can people find you and get in contact with you if they want to follow your work and uh, keep up with you? So they could uh, follow me on Twitter. I think I'm uh, at Dr. Steve Jacobs. Uh, if you go to whendoeslifebegin.org, it's just a fantastic resource where we don't only list the sources, we actually show you a screenshot of the original source. 
So you don't have to take our word for it that the source says a certain thing. You can actually see the, you know, a screenshot of the website or a photo of the book that states that. So that's just a, a fantastic resource that I mm. hope can, uh, take hold in the pro-life movement that we can really start stomping out this opposition to the humanity of fetuses because it's so well proven from the pro-abortion side, from the pro-life side, from the scientific and legal perspective. So yeah. I really think that's where most of our energy should go, that if we lived in a society where everyone recognized a fetus as a human, we, there would not be the support for abortion that there is today. It truly is artificially inflating support for abortion rights and uh, yep. artificially declining the support for fetal rights. Yeah. Well, uh, as we conclude the show, I want to do what I always do and thank the Good Source supporters, those people who have contributed financially to the ongoing research production and time it takes to bring you these conversations, write articles and, and curate a website where these are a forever resource for you, for your information and education. If you would like to become a Good Source supporter, you're most welcome. Uh, that can start from whatever little amount you have each month. Uh, and of course, the more generous you are, uh, then you're actually sponsoring and, and helping pay it forward for other people who can't afford to. Uh, you can become a Good Source supporter at goodsource.news forward slash support. That's good, S-A-U-C-E dot news. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you there. Uh, in fact, this video is so long, what I'll probably do with it is put half an hour out there for broadcast and the long extended version available uh, for members and, and those financial supporters. Uh, and that will be available for you at any level of financial support. So again, thank you to the Good Source supporters for helping this happen. And uh, my guest today, Dr. Steve Jacobs. It's been fun and we'll see you later. Thanks so much, Dave. to do something. Na, 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 na.